morning to each and everybody. Uh, third week of our course. And I hope that you already feel uh, a bit more uh, alert for the various uh, categories of the oil market, the making of the price, uh, the different actors. And speaking of the actors, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the International Energy Agency, which um, uh, we, we briefly mentioned last Thursday before finishing the course. Um, the International Energy Agency was founded in immediate reaction to the major oil crisis of 1973. Uh, just to um, remember, 19, October 1973, uh, a very well coordinated military attack by Syria and Egypt against Israel on uh, the uh, Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, that's why it's called the Yom Kippur War, Actually, it also happened in the midst of Ramadan. So some call it the Ramadan war, the Yom Kippur war. Anyway, it was a, it was a kind of, uh, of huge surprise. And Israel suffered from its first major military setback. Uh, for those of you who are interested in Middle Eastern affairs, who have studied the history of the Middle East a bit, um, you know, the, the series of wars that we have seen ever since the establishment of Israel, uh, General Assembly Resolution 1947, the war starting in spring 1948. And then we had this major war of 1967, the so-called Six-Day War, June 1967, when Israel was uh, uh, managed within a very few, not even a week, six days, uh, to conquer uh, new uh, well, to conquer territory, which beforehand uh, was part of either the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, when we speak of the West Bank, even though the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan was not really uh, running it in, in, in a legitimate, or was not legitimized to, to, to run it, but this is a different story. Anyway, Israel had conquered huge chunks of territory, and in 1973 we had this uh, revenge, uh, so to call, so six years later, uh, Anwar Sadat, uh, Gam, um, uh, uh, Sadat of Egypt and uh, Hafez al-Assad of uh, Syria were able to, to move on, to advance. And in order to preempt a complete defeat by Israel, the United States for the first time intervened militarily. And that was also the first big hour of OPEC. It was the time when Arab member countries of OPEC decided to impose an oil embargo. So this oil embargo really put OPEC into the headlines. We were speaking about it briefly last time, uh, but just to, to also remember what I showed you about this cartoon, the, the perception, and I call it a misperception of OPEC for many, many years, namely uh, this Eastern uh, Muslim uh, cartel of Arab sheikhs, so to say, I'm not exaggerating, but this is a bit the way it is perceived, uh, blackmailing uh, the poor market economies of the West. This, this is a, a perception um, that is still prevailing on many, many levels when it comes to, um, to how OPEC is perceived. And um, in order to be less dependent on OPEC oil, but not only on OPEC oil, also on general data when it comes to oil reserves, when it comes to uh, possible interruptions, the International Energy Agency was established in 1974. The International Agency, uh, Energy Agency is legally speaking uh, part of the OECD, of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development based in Paris. And uh, the IEA is headed today by uh, Mr. Birol. Um, he's from Turkey. Actually, he studied, uh, he spent a long time of his life in, in Austria. He was studying and I think also teaching here at the Technical University. And what is the role of, of IEA? It is a counterweight, first of all, to say, uh, to uh, the dependence on OPEC oil that uh, was felt, very closely felt, with the oil embargo in 1973-74. Remember, the oil price increased then by four times within a few weeks. And that led to a major uh, crisis. Uh, the pump stations were empty and um, the, oil, the, the world was running out of oil. 
So uh, the, uh, the, the idea to establish something like the IEA came from Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State. And he said, we need uh, some sort of alternative system uh, that, uh, that would help us, the industrial countries, the oil importers, the traditional oil, oil importers, uh, to handle uh, such a situation or first of all, to preempt that it would ever repeat itself. So uh, the main objectives of the International Energy Agency was first of all, to improve systems for coping with such an oil supply disruption. And for that very reason, oil stocks were put in place. You see it in the last paragraph on, on that slide. Oil stocks um, that every member state of the IEA would uh, handle uh, a reserve, a national reserve uh, that can uh, that differ sometimes from 50 days, 60, 70 days, or maybe sometimes even uh, longer. So that uh, if there is an oil supply disruption, uh, national consumption can still be met through these stocks. Uh, and this is an important issue, speaking of stocks. Actually, we also have gas stocks, not only oil stocks. And um, when we speak about the price, and you read uh, uh, an article in a uh, in a proper energy magazine uh, like uh, Platts or uh, well, the, the, the real oil paper is not now in, an, uh, in, a, in, a, in a daily, in any kind of daily. Uh, the, the articles when uh, speaking of, about oil price developments or gas price developments will often also hint at the, at the stocks. Uh, right now, the situation is that the stocks are very, very full. And this uh, leads to, to, to uh, even bigger pressure on the price in the sense that the price is low, the price could, could even fall uh, even more, or the price is moving. Uh, right now, what uh, I've been reading uh, over the weekend when it comes to gas stocks, uh, some of the gas stocks are uh, uh, emptying a bit because uh, the economy picks up uh, in, in many uh, countries, not only China, also in others, uh, uh, where, where we have been moving out of the, of the lockdown. Uh, so the, the role of the stocks is quite important. And stocks were created in 1974. Uh, stocks are usually run by uh, the state and uh, the major oil companies. Uh, so uh, sometimes you have just a national oil company, a major one, or you have two or three oil companies in, in, in Germany, it's organized in a federal way. Uh, in Austria, it's the state ministry of economy plus OMB, for instance. And uh, this uh, ever since actually has preempted any kind of oil price, uh, oil, oil crisis or uh, running out of oil that we saw uh, back in 1973. Um, but above that, the International Energy Agency is also about uh, compiling data and uh, so promoting uh, exchange of data, promoting information system on the international oil market. And uh, for those of you who, among you, who are interested in this topic to, to study it more, um, in your syllabus you will find uh, as uh, sources of uh, information the OPEC website, opec.org, and on that website you can download uh, as a PDF uh, the World Oil Outlook, which is published by OPEC every year in autumn. Uh, it started, I think, only 12, 13 years ago to have such a, a major compilation of data, while the en International Energy Agency has already started to, uh, to, um, to release the World energy report every year and that unfortunately you cannot download it on the website uh, but uh, maybe you can find it in the library or if you're really interested in pursuing this topic uh, it's interesting because it gives you a very precise compilation of data so for who uh, for those of you who would like to to develop more um, knowledge expertise on this topic reading the world energy report or don't have to read the entire thing, but it's, it, it's a good data book. It's a good source of, uh, of uh, looking up certain facts and figures. 
And also, and this is now uh, an, another important aspect, um, and that was one of the major ideas of Kissinger and his team, so to say, promote other forms of energy. As of 1974, we saw a rise in alternative technology. Uh, and the alternatives of the 1970s were partially renewables. Uh, you, you had the first wind farms, but it was all about hydrogen, most uh, first and foremost. And you had, above all, nuclear. Uh, the huge um, chapter of nuclear power stations in the US, in Europe, or Japan, above all, also was the 1970s. Uh, the nuclear energy was then considered uh, as an emission-free, uh, controllable uh, means of, uh, of energy production, power production, in order not to be so much dependent on, uh, on oil. Um, I forgot now to put a slide in here on that, but just to take note of, of, of another important figure. OPEC controlled until 1973 about 55% of daily production. 55% of daily oil production was done by the then OPEC member countries. The watershed line of that oil embargo put OPEC into this um, kind of enemy position uh, that I've been describing and its market share in terms of daily production uh, broke down. Uh, ever since, and that was not happen, didn't happen from one day to the next, but it was the development of the 1980s, OPEC lost market share, and today's market share of OPEC, and that has been the case for the past decades, uh, is uh, moving around 30-something percent. So OPEC market share, 30 percent, non-OPEC countries uh, controlling the much higher market share. However, we always have to bear in mind, in terms of reserves, OPEC is important. So 1973, uh, oil embargo, major oil prices, inflation starting, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, OPEC becoming really important, OPEC turning into a major actor. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you had this reaction by the oil importing countries, the industrial countries or member countries of the International Energy Agency. So, please, the next one. Yeah, uh, the reserves. Uh, so, OPEC is important when it comes to reserves. You see here, 80% of today's known reserves are inside OPEC member countries. Uh, on, um, in, 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 you have here the current uh, number, the list of, of, of member countries. And uh, again, Venezuela, which is here in orange, is the country which is not uh, so much maybe in the, in, in, in known to, to, to many people. Uh, Venezuela is the country with the highest uh, number of reserves. And uh, when we count conventional plus unconventional oil, shale oil, tar sands, uh, the more difficult uh, um, reserves to drill, and we will speak in, in, in a minute more about fracking, um, that is uh, the methods to drill that. So in terms of market share, OPEC controls 30% something. Uh, we have a much higher share uh, of today's um, production done by non-OPEC countries, such as the Russian Federation, such as Mexico, and of course also the United States, which over the last 15 years, thanks to the uh, tremendous uh, development inside the fracking industry has moved up. But again, we are in a, in a new situation of the market given the, the very low oil price and uh, the, the high costs. So remember, uh, the big asset of OPEC is easy to drill conventional oil. Easy to drill means cheap. And um, in, in a scenario of a low oil price, as we have it right now, and this, as it might most probably remain, at least for this year, uh, or for the foreseeable time, uh, OPEC member countries will uh, be able to, to deal with this price 
But the big caveat, of course, is, and, and we discussed it with uh, Saudi Arabia, and we can still discuss it, of course, also today. Um, the Gulf countries, the OPEC Arab Gulf countries, uh, such as Saudi Arabia, such as the United Arab Emirates, uh, Kuwait, they need a high oil price, not because of the drilling costs, but oil revenues are their only revenues. No tax income. Now the Saudis have, have introduced value-added tax, but uh, that could still have to be withdrawn uh, because of uh, internal uh, unease. And uh, so the situation is, um, is, well, it's very uncertain. <laughs> I know that this is not a satisfying uh, answer, but uh, that's all what can be said uh, about uh, today's oil market situation, very low price. And even for the OPEC member countries, it's not easy to live with such a low price, given uh, the money they need for preserving social stability. Uh, inside their countries and um, well, the very uh, special foreign policy, military interventions many of these countries have done over decades and which also costs money. Uh, the example that we already discussed, the Yemen war, for instance. Please, the next one. Uh, in December 2016, the new format OPEC Plus was established. What is OPEC plus? 13 OPEC member states plus 10 non-OPEC producers, among them the Russian Federation. Um, on this picture, you see uh, the Russian Minister of Oil Energy, uh, Mr. Novak, and the then Saudi Minister of Oil, uh, Mr. al Falih. Uh, it's not only this picture that shows that there's uh, a good chemistry between the two gentlemen, but from what I have been observing, I think there really was a very good working relationship between the two of them. And uh, of course, in, in, in working relations, it's above all, you have to make a convergence between interests. This is, this is the, the main uh, agenda. But of course, it helps. And it can often be a gate opener, a door opener, uh, if in a in, in, in addition to this rapprochement of interests, you have a working a, a, a chemistry uh, that, that catches the, 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 the relation, that makes uh, working relations easier. Now, Mr. al Falih was ousted from office uh, last uh, September, uh, and um, he, he was the one who really had established uh, the, the functioning of OPEC Plus. Uh, some voices said one of the many reasons why in March of this year, two, three months ago, uh, there was no consensus between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia on the quota was maybe due to the fact that Minister al Falih was not anymore there. Uh, his successor, one of uh, a member of the royal family, uh, I have never met him, but uh, is uh, is maybe not so much. Uh, let's put it. Uh, is, is is maybe not so much in charge of the whole topic, to, to put it mildly. Uh, so people, as always, make a difference, and uh, the ousting of Minister Al Falih, I think, uh, contributed to to the weakening of the OPEC Plus format. This this is my far away perception. Um, OPEC plus, uh, so comprises 23 oil producers. They coordinate their production. They face a common problem, which is a low price. And this low price we had it over the last uh, three, four years. That's why this format was established. Question mark, will this format survive 2020? Uh, I am just the analyst, the outsider, but my assessment would be, I think there's this old phrase, Tina, there is no alternative. So they will have to work together because it's in their common interest. And interestingly enough, it's also the United States that is supporting this cooperation, uh, as we have discussed at the very beginning of our course. So uh, as long as these interests uh, converge and that prevails, 
um, it will somehow work. This is this is my expectation. I think we are now coming to the last slide. Yeah, sorry, that's it. Thank you for your attention. So uh, about 20 minutes have passed. Uh, uh, we can now discuss uh, still questions on OPEC. Maybe you have also questions from last Thursday. And then I will move into the fracking industry, please. OK, any uh, questions? Yes, I would like to uh, ask a question. Please. please. Um, uh, thank you. First of all, and uh, I would like to ask about uh, Al Falih, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, why uh, is he not a minister uh, who uh, who can uh, help to <clears throat> well to make uh, the relation uh, the relations between uh, APEC and uh, non-APEC countries better? Mm -hmm. So your, your question, um, there was some acoustic problem. Is about this the former Saudi oil minister? Is this correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is. Well, yeah. Uh, why is he not any more minister and why is the current situation not that maybe easy in terms of working yes. relations? Um, my information from what I have been getting from some people who, who, who follow that more closely is as often in life, it, it was maybe human jealousy, you know. Uh, I, uh, the, the former oil minister was a very popular man inside Saudi Arabia, maybe he still is, uh, very professional, and uh, he was not only oil minister, he was also chairman of Saudi Aramco, the national oil company, and he had some other mandates uh, which he did well use uh, for uh, the, the development of the Saudi economy. And maybe he was too successful, too popular, then that can sometimes uh, bring you down uh, by those who want to have uh, more control. I mean, I, uh, I know a little bit what I'm talking about because I've experienced that myself in life. But maybe the other major reason why he was ousted uh, to, 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 to move from the human ambit to, to the technical ambit was... Um, the Saudi oil minister was very reluctant about uh, privatizing uh, a certain part of Saudi Aramco. In last November, December, uh, I think it was in the end, it was only two or three percent of uh, the capital of Saudi Aramco was uh, brought to the stock exchange market. It was uh, announced as the biggest uh, launch uh, on the stock exchange market. Uh, uh, Al Fatil had always been warning against the timing, saying the oil price is now fairly low. It even uh, it, it fell down uh, a month later, even lower, as we know. And he said we would lose money, and uh, it's not the right timing to do so. While uh, the royal house, uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, wanted to have this privatization of this. Uh, Two, three percent initially. It's, I think it was even considered five percent of Saudi Aramco to have it privatized, because he said, "I want to have this money to implement my Vision 2030." Vision 2030 uh, was written by the U.S. consultancy McKinsey some years ago, and it's all about bringing Saudi Arabia into a new age of diversification. Less oil dependence, uh, more income from other sources uh, outside of the oil market, and M Mohammed bin Salman, or as he's, he's often called MBS, uh, was most probably at odds with his oil minister, and that was most probably uh, the main reason why uh, this gentleman had to quit. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any further questions, please? I don't see uh, any blue hands <coughs> raised or something in the chat. Uh, please uh, do indicate uh, if you wish to uh, if you wish to ask if a I, question. If I might ask something. Quick. Okay, no. Martin, please. Um, initially, Saudi Aramco, the plan uh, was to launch an IPO in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. But as of August last year, they've decided to shun Hong Kong Mm -hmm. and go for the Tokyo Stock Exchange for the yeah. privatization. Yeah, yeah and in the end ideas? it was done in Riyadh, yeah. Why, why these uh, constant changes in the plans mm -hmm. for IPO? Why would you 
Yeah, you're fully right, uh, Martin. You're very well informed on, on these details. I think in, in the initial very beginning, as far as I recall, it was even considered to do it in London and New York to really pick the, uh, the big stock exchange market. And then they were looking for some other places. In the end, it was done only in Riyadh, yeah, which is now not uh, the place to be when you, when you launch uh, um, uh, a privatization and going and, and, and becoming part of the stock exchange market. Uh, why were these shifts? I think these shifts uh, illustrate uh, the uncertainty, the, 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 the internal, maybe even struggle that was there between the royal house between Saudi Aramco, between different consultants who said, we have to do this, and then they said, no, no, I, I prefer that. Uh, it, I, I think it only in, illustrates an internal struggle. Uh, principal question, to do it? And if so, how and where to do it? And in the end, it didn't materialize the way people had wanted it to be. Uh, there was much more media coverage about that IPO, about that going to the stock exchange market by Saudi Ramco, than uh, a real impact for uh, for the company, for the 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 the, 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 uh, the shareholders. By the way, just as a footnote, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm have no inside information. That's also what you hear. It's a kind of of, of rumor, and it was reported by some critical media in the Middle East. Uh, the royal house forced uh, members of the royal family and other billionaires in Saudi Arabia to buy shares. So uh, there was really a kind of uh, political uh, leverage on future shareholders. You know, I mean, that's not the way you do it. Uh, and, and I think all those elements have contributed uh, to, 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 to the way it happened. It, 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 it was not a success story. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, other questions, please? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Please. Hello, uh, uh, Alexander. Yeah. No. Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Knassel. Uh, first of all, thank you for the lecture. Yes, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. The United States is not a member of OPEC and does not participate in OPEC agreements but it's still the third largest oil producer in the world. Yeah. Um, have there been any attempts to establish practical cooperation between OPEC and the United States? Because in fact, in the context of a decrease in oil production by OPEC countries and their partners, countries not participating in those agreements can simply expand their market share. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very relevant, pertinent question. Actually, OPEC has been looking for institutional dialogue with many other actors. The oldest such institutional dialogue is the one between OPEC and IEA, OPEC and, and the International Energy Agency. Interestingly enough, IEA established in the 1970s as a counterweight to OPEC, over the 90s and the early 2000s had turned into a partner in exchange of information because uh, everybody knew we, we need each other. Stabilize the market, not having too big surprises is in the interest of both producers and consumers. Now that dialogue uh, sometimes uh, functioned in a nice way, sometimes depending maybe also on the acting persons was less successful. We have an OPEC dialogue established with China, established with the European Union, and all these dialogues happen like every six months. So it's really an institutional dialogue. And we have seen over the last decades, as long as I can remember, I've been covering OPEC meetings for 22 years, and you always saw as observers important non-OPEC countries invited. So the the, the a Russian delegation was always there, a Norwegian delegation was always there, but as you correctly point out, I never saw a US, uh, well, you had US analysts, but you never had people uh, who would represent US government, who would represent uh, the uh, energy, uh, the secretary for energy, etc. So now uh, in, uh, in, in April, apparently President Trump got himself personally involved 
uh, and called uh, not the OPEC secretariat, but he called an important OPEC country, the, the most important producer, Saudi Arabia. And the United States slightly participated, not officially, but had an interest in bringing the oil price up because it was so low and said, it's, we all share the common interest in stabilizing the oil market. I don't see uh, the third largest oil producer uh, creating a genuine institutional dialogue with OPEC uh, and joining, for instance, the OPEC plus format, <laughs> because then I, honestly, we would have all the oil producers inside, not only, uh, not only the 23 that we have right now, but also other important producers such as US and Canada. I don't see that happen. But who knows, maybe uh, there will be a, a more substantial contact, some could then even call it dialogue. Uh, but for the time being, the United States wishes to keep to, to, to stay outside. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, further questions, please. Can I also ask a question? Sure, yes, please. Nikita. Uh, okay, so I have come across an opinion piece uh, which claimed that Russia, along with Saudi Arabia, could really be interested in a democratic win in the coming presidential elections, precisely because the Democratic Party has a vast economic agenda and this excessive economic legislation could really uh, crack down on the fracking industry of the United States of America and thus basically uh, and thus basically force uh, the United States of America to get rid of this economic leverage of the oil market. And mm -hmm. that's why Russia and Saudi Arabia are really interested or should be interested in a democratic win, the kind of presidential mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Uh, as, as you uh, correctly said at the beginning, it's an opinion piece, you know, <laughs> so somebody, has uh, shared an opinion and all opinions uh, uh, should be based on, on, on some factual indications why this or that could move in, in, in such a way. Um, my guess, and I say explicitly guess, because I, it's impossible to now predict a certain trend. Uh, my guess is um, in the current price situation, the fracking industry, whether it's on shale oil or on shale gas, is in a very big quagmire. How will it survive? We will speak about it still in more detail today, but all these fracking companies are built on uh, credits, on bank credits. Uh, they, they don't have, they are not, uh, they, they, they have no huge proper capital uh, to survive the current situation. Uh, so banks will move in, you will see a lot of these companies disappear, maybe others uh, reappear, pop up somehow. Um, one thing is sure that Donald Trump uh, has a very big heart for the traditional industry in the United States, be it coal, be it steel industry, be it the new one, which is not that new because the US was always an oil producer. Uh, much more important in the 1920s and 30s. But the fracking industry played definitely a very important part in the election campaign of Trump back in 2016. Uh, and as we know, it was a surprise that, that Trump had won the elections. Uh, but uh, I always said, well, uh, he, he represents uh, a big part of, of, of US interests, which, which is this... Uh, these industries and uh, they, they, they gave money for his election campaign and they are also now interested in having him, keeping him for a second mandate. Uh, whether the US fracking industry will survive the current situation, I think depends less on whether Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump wins the elections. It depends much more on where will be the price of oil and gas in the coming years. This is the, the, the fundamental reason whether they will make it or not make it because none of these fracking companies has enough money at the bank to survive the current situation. Really, 
they 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 are in a in a in, in big troubles. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope so the questions, please, if any. So I don't see anything in the chat. <laughs> I don't see any indications in the list of part. Oh, Nikita. Uh, Nikita Lipunov wants to ask a question, please, Nikita. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, Frau Kneissel, vielen Dank für die Vorlesung. Bitte. Und für die Freude und Vorlesungen auch. Uh, uh, so, my question will touch upon the topic of the notorious APEC meeting in March. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there, there has been a lot of speculation about uh, well, the real motivation uh, you know, of uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia. And uh, there have also been accusations uh, on both sides. But in your opinion, what was uh, the real uh, motivation yeah. of both of the countries? And who is actually to blame for, yeah. uh, for that discord? Well, thank you very much, Nikita, for, for this interesting question. I have also been reading about uh, various um, motivations. And as you rightly say, it's very difficult to say who is to blame. And I also think that this blame game doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help um, the oil price. And the oil price then imploded, is low, and such a low oil price uh, uh, actually is, is, is unhelpful, I would say, even for consumers. Uh, why? Because if nobody is ready to invest, in, uh, in, 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 in exploring new oil fields, we could have a bottleneck, uh, a, a reduction of supply, and we could see, if not in this year, but uh, then in two, three years from today, another uh, price increase that, uh, that would hurt the consumers. Uh, and, and anyway, the current very low oil price uh, is, is not really useful for, for many of us because uh, uh, we are all somehow condemned, if I may say, to immobility. I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we can rarely make use of it. Uh, so then uh, when, when you think of mobility and driving, uh, but who did what, who, so to say, is to blame, who made the first mistake, very, very difficult to say. Maybe it was more about perceptions also than reality. Um, maybe uh, OPEC or the Saudi delegation in particular confronted the Russian counterparts with a take it or leave it position. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe it was just a, a misunderstanding. I have no idea, but I believe that the fact what I mentioned beforehand that we do not anymore have uh, the same people on the Saudi side, uh, like like the former uh, oil minister Al Fatih, that that has contributed to uh, to 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 a, to a, a worse form of communication. This is my observation. I think this this has definitely contributed. Um, but who started it? did which side had what kind of strategy in mind uh, impossible to say okay thank you you're welcome gerne so uh i think that at this moment we have exhausted our immediate questions perfect Am thank I you right? very much so it we move to so. the next presentation which mm -hmm. is about unconventional oil Drilling, and yes. we often also call it the fracking industry as such. Just a second, Karina. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just take your time. I will start talking in the meantime. Here I need to for the yeah. presentation, and I will start. Remember, in the first class, I introduced you to conventional versus unconventional oil and gas uh, production, and we used some of the terms. So just to recall those thank you very much ekaterina here uh, just just a second more yeah, it yeah, seems yeah, that something plan. doesn't work don't this worry plant. um fracking industry there is no translation into german uh, we also call it fracking industry shale oil we call it schiefer gas uh, schiefer oil shale shale gas schiefer gas 
Schiefer, it's a, it's an, it's a part of these sediments because how is shale oil extracted? Shale oil is extracted not in this traditional vertical way. It's more of a horizontal um, way of drilling, which we will describe in a minute, discuss in a minute. And um, the fracking industry uh, developed uh, between, let's say, the late 1990s until 2010. And I recall uh, a conference I attended in 2010 where the delegation of the United States, there were some people from the U.S. Energy Department, announced back in May 2010 that the United States will turn back, uh, will, will reconquer the market and turn into a major oil and gas producer and exporter. And I remember very well the, the atmosphere in this conference room. Uh, actually, it was in Ashgabat. It was an energy conference in Turkmenistan held, organized by the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I remember my personal surprise, the surprise in the room. Uh, I'd been reading about fracking uh, the years prior, and I, I myself was always very reluctant about the role of shale oil and shale gas for various reasons. Uh, but I was maybe wrong in not seizing that shale oil and shale gas, gas would really turn into a game changer. Uh, in the syllabus, I have called this session shale oil a temporary game changer. Uh, so I, I allowed myself to add this adjective, this attribute, temporary. Why? Because right now we have the situation, surprise, surprise, uh, the oil price is so low, but really so low that it's very difficult for the fracking industry to compete with that. It, it, it simply makes no sense to drill oil at, at uh, exploration costs they have of around at least 40 US dollar per barrel when the price is somewhere between 15 and 20 US dollar. Um, can we see? That? I mean, it seems that I have a problem because uh, there is a, um, a parallel uh, program running calendar uh, which is now uh, not functioning properly I... here. And um, what I can do, I can uh, resend your presentation to all the uh, participants right now. Yeah. Because uh, I'm afraid that I need to reload my computer to be... Yeah, yeah, but you, you, you can reload your computer. Yeah. Sh shall we make a brief break of, of two, three minutes? Would yeah, you... if, if it is possible. Could yeah, we yeah, of course. Uh, course for me, make it? everything mm -hmm. is possible. So I will be so leaving we, the we conference. We make a brief break room. and then... Just uh, let, okay. let us take uh, three, four minutes. I will send the presentation okay. to everyone and Thank I you. will uh, reload computer in uh, meanwhile. Good. pleasure i have i have one possible Please. hello a bit, one a, bit out, <laughs> a, bit, a bit outside the topic but the 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 discourse is always centered on the fact that the middle east needs to like diversify the economy and find alternative investments as is the case with dubai and successfully but we have seen that this model has sort of failed like in the in, until the present before the coronavirus uh, pandemic because they had like very the break even point was very unstable yeah. and now with the crisis they have entered complete uh, default mode in dubai and need the bailout from abu dhabi do you think that the diversification that is being done right now is wrong given this or mm. or not what uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, among the United Arab Emirates, I think there are five or seven Emirates. I, I don't recall now very well. I only know Abu Dhabi and Dubai. I've been there. I don't know so well the others. I mean, but these two are the most important. And to 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 be very general, 
Abu Dhabi was always the money provider for the rest, but <laughs> Dubai was, so to say, the place to be, the shopping mall, the, the new regional headquarter for the air, um, airline business and so on. Um, what was the concept of uh, the Emir of Dubai when he said, I want to turn Dubai into the place to be in the Middle East, you know? He wanted to to make it a kind of Beirut of the 70s banking center, insurance center. You know, Beirut before the civil war, before that, it was not really a civil war, it was a proxy war, whole regional war. The, the, the war officially ended in 1990. But unfortunately, Beirut could never regain its position as the banking center of the Middle East uh, because it was just too uncertain for many. Uh, also, let me say, too corrupt. Uh, even so, you have very professional bankers in Lebanon. But what happened was that many Lebanese business people went to Dubai and continued to do this uh, mediation work between Asia, Middle East, Europe, Africa, the United States, being at home in many places of the world. <laughs> oh, Winston. Sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> Winston. <laughs> Uh, so uh, they, uh, the Lebanese moved to, to Beirut. Yeah, sorry. I, I, sorry, I, I have to that they are now. Sorry, there, was, there must be somebody in the street, so they moved up. I see Winston is not a fan of diversification. <laughs> <laughs> well, he looks like Winston Churchill, honestly, and that's why I called him Winston. Uh, most of the time he's very calm, but uh, something must have disturbed him outside. Um, so the Lebanese bankers moved to Dubai and continued a bit this kind of business, uh, moving big funds, big money, you know, the billionaires of the world having now their new place in the banks of Dubai. Uh, and you had this real estate bubble because it was a genuine bubble. <laughs> I would say it is still a bubble. As you said, Dubai was saved by Abu Dhabi. Uh, I think that was in 2009 or 2010 when uh, they had simply overstretched uh, their building uh, ambitions and uh, Dubai had to pay a certain price for that bailout by the Emir of Abu Dhabi, by Ambitet, in the sense that they had to cut back on some of the, let's say, let's put it, too liberal lifestyle, you know, uh, uh, it didn't match with, with, the, with the overall concept. And not only it was a question of matching, but also if I put myself into the place of one of those emirs, who are they afraid of? The clergy. You know, you, you don't have an opposition, you don't have a parliamentarian opposition, you have the clergy, which is your opposition. Uh, it's a bit like the emperor of the Holy German em Holy Roman Empire. You know who was his opponent? It was the Pope. Uh, you did not have well. You had the the, the other feudal lords, but your biggest uh, dangerous uh, opponent could always be the Pope. And this is a little bit the situation uh, with the various royal houses on the Arabian Peninsula. You have to manage somehow not to antagonize the clergy too much. And that definitely was also a problem for, for Dubai, I think. Uh, where do we stand today? Um, tremendous shopping malls. Uh, Dubai wanted to be the inter alia, the regional airport, uh, how do you call the platform, you know? Uh, uh, something like Frankfurt for, for Europe, plus uh, some, some other uh, goodies. With the current situation, the airline industry, immobility, and I don't think that that will improve tremendously. I don't see it happen uh, because people will travel less. I don't see a replay of the tremendous airline uh, moving uh, that we had before the pandemic pick up this summer, in autumn or next year, for various reasons, uh, millions of people out of work, companies saving money for business flights, uh, 
doing this kind of video conferences we are doing. They are not, uh, they cannot replace all meetings, but they can replace some meetings. Who will still afford business class? Also a matter for the, the cost issue, cost expenditure of, of a company. So I think that Dubai, like many others, will suffer a lot because its diversification was in the airline, in the tourism sector. And what I mentioned beforehand, the banking, insurance business, and so on, um, I think in the end, people will look for safer havens, havens uh, to, to do financial transactions and so on. This, this, this could still be London, this could still be uh, Switzerland, Frankfurt, or whatever, you know. They, I, I'm not so much into that world, but um, it's, uh, we, we do have a very, very volatile situation in the Gulf. The stability of various governments in the light of a very low oil price is, is an issue. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Karen, it seems that uh, I have managed to quibble. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. So Thank that's, uh, is this the right presentation? Uh, it should say, I, I saw it beforehand. You had put it on beforehand. I saw it, for, but it did not really. Is, it, is, it, is this the wrong one I put? Unconventional oil gas production. One second. I don't, right now I don't see anything. Beforehand I saw one, but now I don't see anything. Here it is. Is this the right one? It should say uh, session five. Session. Okay, so again, the wrong one. Oh, oh, oh. No, but, it, but, it does, it. but it does say session five. Session Katya. five fracking. It does say session five, the one yeah, you, yeah. you were just showing. It does say session five. Look. This is a session one, uh, session no, five fracking. Session five, uh, below the name. Migimo session five. Yeah, yeah. Five. yeah. So th this is the uh, initial slide. Yeah, I saw it beforehand, but I don't see it now. Oh, oh, oh why not? How about others, guys? Uh, can you see the uh, screen? Sure, we see, uh, sure. see, yes. I can see it. Yes, yes, yes it's okay. See it. price, 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 factors. Factors. price factors, supply and demand, geopolitics, etc. Karin, how about you? I don't see it, but I don't see it, unfortunately. But I know it by heart somehow. <laughs> so believe me, please. Uh, the slide says price factors, supply and demand, geopolitics and geo yeah. geopolitic, demographic factors. The yeah. You know what I will do? You know what I will do? I, I move with my notebook to my desktop because I have it also on my desktop. So no problem. I can watch it on my desktop. Sorry for that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, it's not an oil an issue. <laughs> uh, one second. I will just put it here on my desktop and we can start. My desktop is already a bit low, too much on it. One second. Unconventional oil and gas production implications and so on. Schiefer oil and Schiefer gas. Here we are. If we go on the on the first slide inside after the, 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 the opening slide, you see price factors, supply and demand. Uh, I would like to, to bring you back to the, to the list of basics uh, because uh, when I said, well, the question I think Nikita asked beforehand, uh, where will the fracking industry stand? Will, what kind of, of, of uh, political influence will there be by the outcome of the US elections? My answer was, in the end, it's a matter of price, you know? Whether the fracking industry will survive or not, 
I don't think that it will be subsidized by the US taxpayer. I don't see it happen. So in the end, it's all a matter of price. So what are the price factors? Let us go back to the very fundamentals of, uh, of the various elements that make up the oil price. Supply and demand, very important to always keep that in mind. Do we have oversupply right now? Yes, we do. What about the demand? Tremendous peak in demand. Um, I put here on, uh, a bit lower and, and let me convey this as a major message of today's class. It's always possible to create supply, but it's impossible to create demand once demand has peaked. Um, go back to the 1970s. Oil embargo, 1973. What happened? Companies, governments started to look for oil outside of OPEC. Where did they go? To the North Sea. Um, when the oil price went up and up in the early 2000s, remember the, the, the slides that we had been watching over the last two weeks, these BP slides about the historic movements of the oil price. Um, when the price goes up a lot, what happens? People start to look for oil in other places. Also, for instance, offshore production, offshore Angola, offshore Nigeria, expensive. But when the price is in, in its 70s, 80s, and above 100, it makes sense to do that. And when the price was that high in the mid-2000s, in particular between 2008 and, and uh, 2006, 2008, it went high, high, high. People started to get interested more and more in the fracking industry, in the unconventional oil production, because it started to make sense to produce um, at, at those high exploration costs, because you could get a certain price also for your fracking oil. So supply and demand are the main factors. And uh, I, I, I like to come back here to Saki Yamani, uh, the still alive, uh, very famous former Saudi oil minister, who said a very famous phrase by him, uh, uh, in the short run, the oil price is always a matter of politics. You know, is there a war, is there tension or not? In the long run, it's always the fundamentals of supply and demand that will shape the price. So these are the, 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 the basics. Uh, geopolitics. Geopolitics are on the side of both supply and demand. Do we have a war situation? Do we have a trade war, a cold war, like uh, the one that might be now in the making between the People's Republic of China and the United States? Just uh, let us uh, uh, read the, 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 the statements by um, Foreign Minister Wang, who said yesterday very clearly to the United States, uh, what is happening right now brings us um, at the margin of a cold war between our two countries. So what will that mean for the oil price? Question mark. Demographic factors. Bevölkerungsentwicklung, very, very important because uh, demography uh, has a tremendous impact. Um, let us go to, to our societies, uh, the Russian society, the Central European society, holds true for Western Europe by and large. Overaged society, um, to a large extent, uh, uh, means have been satisfied over the last decades. Uh, when we look at, the, at an issue like taking a driving license, buying a car, uh, we will see that there is not anymore such a big demand for the proper car because uh, the, 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 we have a demographic decline. Um, uh, elderly people don't drive that much like people who are between 18, let's say, and 18 and, 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 and 40. Uh, and uh, urbanization, do people need a car? Can they afford a car? Is it still possible to, uh, to afford a car with all the, 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 the urban um, regulations that you have? That holds true for many cities, such as London, Paris, Vienna. 
it's a nuisance to have a car, uh, etc. So all that uh, affects it. When we take the African continent, a very uh, young population uh, that will definitely need energy to a larger extent for the simple reason that large parts of the African populations, there are many, there's not just one, for the time being are denied access to a proper energy delivery system, electricity and others. Uh, that's also one of the reasons why my guess is that the future big industrial plants for the automotive industry might be on the African continent and not so much in Europe or in North America, because it's there where the car market of the future will probably be. Uh, so, uh, and then also a very important factor, we have seen the financial markets interact more and more over the last 30 years. And uh, the financial markets, the so-called futures, or as we call them in German, Terminkontrakte, have, start, have, have been playing a very important role in the making of the price. Uh, remember, oil is not anymore physically traded in the sense that oil a vessel of oil arrives in a port like Rotterdam, and the, the price of that day when the, when the oil is loaded brought to, to the buyer, it's not the price of that day that is bought, a uh, pay, sorry, but in order to spread risk, and risk is there, you have a weather risk, you have a transport risk, you have a risk of terrorist attacks, you have a risk of war, you have all kinds of risks in the making of the oil price. So uh, buyers started in the 70s, 80s to develop these future contracts. Future contracts mean buyer and consumer decide on a future price for the delivery uh, of an oil cargo, uh, holds true also for gas, at a certain day. And in order to spread the risk, you hedge against all kinds of uh, adversarial uh, developments. Um, this kind of financial instrument made sense as long as we spoke about oil products being traded uh, along these future contracts. What we saw in the 1990s with the deregulation of the financial markets, crude oil was traded on a future basis, not only heating oil and gasoline oil products, where you have a specific audience, you have a specific uh, time when that is used, the heating oil in, in, in the cold season, driving oil, so to say, in the, in the summer season when people drive more. This was the old general rule, not anymore applying to the same extent as it's used to, but still somehow valid. Now, in 2008 and 2009, we saw the breakdown of the financial markets, bubbles, all kinds of bubbles, housing bubble, credit bubble, insurance bubble, you name it, you have it. And one of the bubbles, of course, was the commodity market, the oil market. 2008, tremendous high oil price level, above $140 per barrel. And then after the bankruptcy of uh, the U.S. Lehman Brothers Bank, and then some others would have followed if the U.S. government hadn't uh, nationalized huge banks, American Insurance Group, and so on. There was a tremendous wave of nationalization, temporary nationalization, but it was nationalized in order to save those banks. Uh, and the price, the oil price broke down. Um, banks, investment houses like Goldman and Sachs, uh, JP Morgan, had a portfolio of above 50, 60% in oil futures. So uh, there was a lot of playing. And I already mentioned the term speculation. I told you when I spoke of speculation in, in, in early 2008, people watched me in a skeptical way, but I think it was speculation. Uh, and uh, so all that plays into, and all these are price factors, elements that determine uh, the moving of the price. Let us go now into the next slide about, I think this one should now be on, uh, yeah, geopolitics, let's, uh, uh, let, let's skip that because the, 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 this we have, uh, we have discussed already a lot. Uh, 
the the one on uh, sorry, there's a, a typo. It should say here combining fracking and horizontal drilling, the solution. Do you see this next slide? Target J horizontal drilling. Do you have it? Do you, do you see the yeah. slide? Yeah. 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 Um, maybe let's also skip that slide and go to slide five shale gas production because this is much clearer to start and then we go back. The figure where you have this uh, drilling station and the sediments, do you see that one, shale? Shale gas production techniques and possible exactly. environmental hazards. Guys, can exactly. you, do, do you see the slide? Yes. With the figures. Okay, perfect. Yes. So uh, here I would like to briefly explain to you how fracking, how shale gas, and what is here shale gas, it, it also is valid for shale oil, because our topic is much more the oil market than the gas market. Um, you see here uh, horizontal drilling. So it's not, um, it's not just a vertical. Of course, you, you go vertical from the drilling station above, uh, and you go through water uh, tables, and then um, chemical uh, ingredients are moved into the sediments, into the shale sediments, where pockets of shale oil or shale gas or tar sands are found. So we are not speaking of um, huge oil and gas fields, which thanks to physical pressure, move up then in a, in, a, in a regular way, once you have tapped an oil or gas field in a conventional way, it moves uh, due to physical forces. In that case, you have to fill in water and chemicals in order to bring these sediments, these pockets um, above the surface. Uh, some remarks, this kind of uh, unconventional production is, first of all, much more expensive. Secondly, much more detrimental to the environment. All kind of oil and gas production is detrimental to the environment. Um, because you always need uh, water, you always need uh, huge surfaces. In the case of uh, shale gas, it's even much bigger surfaces. Uh, when you see pictures of former shale oil production in Canada, in the western provinces of Canada, the province of Alberta, which was the first one to start to move into that kind of business, the landscape is really a destroyed one. It looks like a, a moon landscape. Uh, there have been various movements, civil rights movements going on against shale and gas and oil production in the United States. Um, I think it was Matt Diamond who made that film also about called Dirty Gas or something like that, which is a, a documentary that was released more than 10 years ago. But despite those protests, um, shale oil and gas became more and more commercial, uh, more and more popular on, on the political level. And... Uh, Definitely, you can call Donald Trump uh, the U.S. president who, who is riding high on the shale industry. Uh, but when he started his office in 2017, the oil price uh, was still much higher. It was in its uh, 70s, 80s. I don't recall now exactly. It was not that high, but it was. Uh, it it made shale production commercial because depending on the field uh, exploration costs the the, the shift between 40 50 60 dollars it always depends on 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 on, this, on the very field uh, but uh, just to remember fracking requires technology chemistry uh, huge areas and uh, it doesn't work everywhere it works where you have huge surfaces just a note here, uh, China was also thinking about going into shale, but then the, 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 the risk for huge loss of drinking water uh, made the authorities rethink it. 
Poland was very interested in shale in 2011, 2013. I, I remember I was then in Poland for, for some energy conferences and a lot of Polish decision makers were very interested in shale. But the U.S. companies which tried to drill shale uh, gave it up because it, it didn't meet their expectations. Plus, the very important aspect was also a huge opposition by farmers, by civil society. People said, we don't want to have shale drilling in our country. Uh, so uh, the shale industry works commercially very successfully in Canada and in the United States. But... Uh, the crackdown on uh, mobility, uh, the pandemic, has has really put upside down all the all the elements. We we're in a completely new picture now. The next slide, please. So it's unconventional natural gas production. Exactly, type. exactly that 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 figure. Uh, this is just again, it's it, it's some technical aspects that you know the, the notions that are often used. Uh, when we speak of unconventional natural gas, uh, and that also holds true for, for oil, but the uh, shale gas production is even more important than the shale oil production in the US. Uh, the yellow is the shale part. The violet one is the so-called cold bed matter, and the red one is tight. Oil. Uh, we have different terms for all that what we call unconventional. Sometimes you will read in articles tight oil, you will read tar sands, you will read shale as such. And shale is the most important part, but there are also other elements that are part of all that what is produced in terms of fracking. Just to, 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 to familiarize you with some of the notions. Now, honestly, I have no idea how you would call that in German. When I read a German article on unconventional gas production, oil production, it's Schiefer, yes, we, we have Schiefer, but for tight oil, we say tight oil. For cold, bad metan, we use methane. Uh, so it, it, it's a terminology that is very much dominated by the Anglo-Saxon world and therefore by English. And for the French terms, we have uh, gas de schiste, will de schiste, um, and maybe they also have uh, the French, uh, proper French terminology, but I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't put it here because I'm not aware of it. Let us move to the next the map, uh, global unconventional gas activity. Red one is activity, testing wells, and so on. You see North America, US, Canada, uh, and you see Australia, and you see some parts of, of China and India. But as I mentioned beforehand, uh, authorities in those countries, and I would say also in, in, in Australia, have become very reluctant about going in that uh, because they say it risks the risks for drinking water are too high. So. Uh, there is a competition also between water to drink or go into, into unconventional gas and oil production. Important, very important element um, because the water issue is a rising problem on a global level, not only for reasons of hot summers and too warm winters and, and the, 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 the entire topic of uh, climate, but it's also a topic because of the mismanagement of water sources, the mismanagement of wastewater and so on. And that holds true for many, many uh, regions of the world. This, the next one where you see the puppet, the, 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 how do you, the dolls, the Russian dolls. I got that slide from a German colleague some years ago. Uh, he has a French name, you see him below the Ruby, uh, but he's German. And, uh, he made that because he wrote uh, his PhD on, on uh, oil and, um, and gas in unconventional. And he said there's a huge difference between the original gas in place, the recoverable resources, and the technical renewable. So uh, between what you calculate what is there 
in terms of original gas and from what you can extract in a commercial way, that can often differ a lot. So uh, apart from the United States, in many other parts of the world, the unconventional in this oil and gas extraction never gained that role for various reasons. Um, sometimes it was also the huge difference between calculations in the beginning when the first wells were drilled and that was then really economically recoverable. So uh, again, when the price drops, uh, it makes less sense to, to go for it. Now slide number nine, typical decline for curve. Right, so that? here it is, typical yeah. decline curve. Uh, in the beginning you can uh, Extract maybe a lot, but the decline curve for a shale oil well is often much stronger than for a conventional field. One thing that I would like that I forgot to mention beforehand, and that is interesting to say when you remember the slide about this uh, well and the, the horizontal pipelines going into the sediments, it's much easier to open and close an unconventional well than a conventional well. A conventional well, and again, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> there may be among you people who have studied engineering uh, who are much uh, more at ease with, with, with these um, uh, themes. Uh, but once you have an, a, a conventional oil or gas field producing, it's very difficult to close it. Uh, you simply have to make it move. That's why... Uh, even when the price goes down, uh, for some producing countries, it's not easy to cut down on the production rate. It's easier for the, for the unconventional industry. Um, so when the price is low, some of them could go down. Right now, the price is so low uh, that it makes little sense to go for it. Uh, in the next slide, please, slide number 10. Um, conventional exploration can change your mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, here, uh, I, I, I said at the very beginning of this session, for many years, I've been personally very skeptical whether it's a true game changer. I mean, when, when you read about that topic, it will always, they will always use the notion game changer, game changer. Yes, it, it definitely increased supply. And what happened to the fracking industry, not now for the first time, now we have an exceptional situation, but already back in 2014, when the price dropped tremendously for various reasons, we have discussed it, many of them had to close, had to rethink, had to invest in new technology to make exploration costs cheaper. Um, it all depends again on the price and uh, and they became victims of their own success because they were the ones who added additional oil and gas to the supply side. And this additional volume of supply has, of course, contributed to the price declines that we have seen over the years in 2009, in 2014, and definitely now, but now again, we are in it. We are in, exceptional, in an exceptional situation. And I don't see the current situation now as the new normal. I hope that we will not see like a lockdown every now and then because of a pandemic. It's impossible to, 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 to run a global economy on that level, not even a national com uh, economy. And nobody is acting in an autonomous way today. We are all interdependent even in a more deglobalized world, but we are interdependent. And uh, so how to, to run it and, 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 and how to make it, it's, I, I would say, I, I put here a question mark. In the syllabus, again, I called it a temporary game changer because with the current low price level, we will see uh, a huge series of bankruptcies among uh, the US fracking industry. Um, just to, to give you one example, Royal Dutch Shell decided in 2013 to stop all shale drilling in North America because they said for themselves it didn't make sense. They preferred to 
pursue the conventional one where it's easier to make money, to put it very, <laughs> very clearly. Uh, smaller companies are better performing. They can uh, work on a trial and error level and, 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 and think what, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, so will it last the whole thing? Will the United States become really energy self-sufficient and so on? Remains to be seen. But let us close here and continue then on Thursday on, on, on the rest of the slides. And uh, let us use the remaining 10 minutes for your questions, because I hope that we didn't lose anybody now in the second part of the class. It's a bit technical, but just to summarize my, my main messages, unconventional oil and gas trailing added tremendous amounts of oil and gas to the supply side, uh, made the price drop to a certain extent, Ex exceptional situation right now. Uh, and uh, the US fracking industry uh, is an important element in spite of all the, 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 the question marks that you have, in particular stemming from ecology. Whether it will be here to stay remains to be seen. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, so do we have any questions? Please speak up or uh, raise the blue hand or chat uh, or use the chat function. Hello. If I might, one short question. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> Our regular question yeah, asker. <laughs> <laughs> If, if it's no problem. Uh, so this, um, the oil dispute between Saudi Arabia and Russia, uh, does the reluctance of Russia in cutting down production uh, show that it's overall conventional production? And is there a strategy to diversify it into unconventional to have like more, in any future crisis, to have more leverage to, not leverage, but flexibility to cut or increase production in any case? Mm. Well, uh, reserves, main question, how many reserves can still be drilled? Uh, and how do you treat your oil and gas fields? Again, I'm not an engineer, but reading about it and listening to people who are in that uh, field, I have often been told you have... <laughs> Please forgive me now my language, but I put it very bluntly. You have to be nice to your oil and gas field. Yeah? Uh, you should not uh, mistreat it. So the moment you exploit too much in too short of a time, you risk to lose it. Uh, because, again, the sediments, even in a conventional oil and gas field, can get lost. You know, They can go down. So uh, it's a matter of high expertise of... Again, under inverted comma, being nice, <laughs> being prudent with your oil and gas field, not overexploit it. The injection of water, the injection of this and that, how much you, you do it, it's a matter of to which extent you have a recovery rate of your relevant oil and gas field. Um, the recovery rates shift a lot, they differ a lot from field to field. Uh, but in many fields, you have a recovery rate. What can you get out of your field that is often below 50%? Uh, so with better technology, with more prudence, you can get out more of a field than if you simply exploit it because right now the price is high and we have to make the most out of it. Uh, the situation in the 1990s, in particular in the Russian Federation, because you asked me that question, was um, that was a kind of, of wilderness of who did what, you know? Uh, and uh, some people say, I'm, 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 I have no insight, but from what I've been reading, that that has contributed to the over-exploration of some fields. Some fields got hurt. Um, Qatar, for instance, uh, has been more prudent with many of its gas fields and said, no, no, we don't want to tap them now. We wait. Uh, we don't want to overexploit them. So there are many, many aspects that are responsible for 
the amount that you get out of your reserves. And uh, where do you still find what reserves? I mean, from time to time, you read a huge gas field nobody had known about beforehand was discovered here and there. Yes, but at what kind of costs? And again, I'm not only speaking about technical costs, commercial costs. At what kind also of ecological costs can you drill, can you explore? Um, when the price was high, um, there was a bonanza towards Sao Tome and Principe in the Gulf of Guinea of West Africa. Uh, which is also a very fragile ecological zone in terms of sea life, maritime life. Uh, as far as I know, I remember from my reading, people have moved out again because it's too expensive. If you want to say good for the mar marine life there, you know, uh, because yes, you can drill there, but it's a matter of costs. And the ecological aspects are often very low on the agenda. In the end, the price is always decided by the price that you can get out of it. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, further questions, please? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody. Nobody. The, the I hope chat, we didn't lose anybody. The chat is, um, is relatively empty and no raised uh, blue hands right now. Okay. Karin, if I may ask a question as well. Uh, uh, it was uh, puzzling me since uh, the end of your uh, previous presentation. Um, who decides uh, how the decision on the oil stocks uh, was made? So how the countries were obliged to have this stoves mm -hmm. or was it just a recommendation of uh, international yeah. agency organization to do the, the this? Uh, well the international energy agency you you i i i have to reread it but from what i remember uh it turned into a kind of membership obligation you are a member of the international energy agency uh by being member of the oecd you pay also a kind of fee to be there you get services such as data reports or so technical assistance. Uh, and in order to make sure that never ever again something happens like the oil embargo of 1973, all IEA countries committed themselves to keeping stocks. And I think it was much more than a recommendation. Maybe they formulated it as a recommendation, but everybody complied with it and uh, started to establish stocks which are expensive because stocks you have to uh, you have to maintain them uh, maintenance costs and uh, interestingly enough in in today's world fragile supply lines just in time delivery on nearly all levels uh, now shaken by the pandemic uh, shaken first of all in china because we saw ah all of a sudden uh, we are so dependent on what happens in China and we didn't see it only there for the first time. I remember in 2010 when we had this volcano explosion on Iceland, maybe you remember in, in early 2010, uh, also the international airline business in the northwestern hemisphere, but not only there, was suffering because of the cloud, because of this volcanic cloud, nobody traveled. And also then supply lines were hit. And there was already a debate then, ah, we should be more careful, uh, not have uh, key elements supplied only by just in time, but stock them somewhere. So in case there is a problem, at least have a contingent for, I don't know, three, four weeks. To my knowledge, little has been done on that. We do have stocks when it comes to oil and gas. And I think that some countries also have a normative obligation to have a stock on flour and uh, sugar and whatever for the basic needs of the population. Was a debate also right now when the pandemic started, but definitely not to the same extent as we stock oil and gas. We, we have learned from the crisis of 73. We have learned from the crisis of 2006 and 2009. Uh, so, Governments are ready to invest in those maintenance costs, 
but when it comes to, to really preserve supply chains of antibiotics, pharmacy by and large, spare parts for computers, spare cards for strategic communication, etc., we are much more dependent on fragile supply lines, uh, whether they come now from Taiwan, from Korea, from China, from wherever, uh, than we, I think, are ready to admit. Okay, thank you, thank you. I knew that uh, Japan, as an OECD member, has a, uh, an oil stock which must serve for uh, 80 or 90 days, something yeah. in case of emergency. But yeah. that was quite uh, a new information to me that uh, actually all members uh, were obliged yeah. to have this well, stock. Uh, we, we in Austria, I, I don't recall now for all the others, but I think in Austria we have something like 60 days. And mm -hmm. uh, when the stocks are replenished when they are very high when they are in their 90 days 100 days of one the prices usually also start to fall because then analysts will say ah the oil the, the oil stocks are over full um, and so on when the oil stocks are low uh because of whatever reason uh prices have a tendency to move up even so there's enough oil on the market but then uh, people who who consult companies who consult investors who buy large parts of futures uh, they will uh, they will hint at the low stocks so in the end it's a it's a mix of many many factors that decide the oil price from minute to minute and and in that of course when we also speak of the financial market we have to bear in mind that um it's electronic algorithms which do it. Mm. It's not rational human beings who uh, who say stop. Uh, and what happened in April when the uh, WTI uh, future markets broke down and went negative, uh, somebody explained to me that there were unexperienced young traders. Uh, some said it had to do with this uh, electronic algorithm. Um, whatever mess, difficult to say, but uh, uh, a lot of the market is not anymore a physical oil market. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a, how should I say? It's a computer market. And maybe to, to finish on that, there's also a, a name for those who, who act in that future market. It's called the Wall Street Refiners. Uh, young wolves, <laughs> when you remember the film uh, yeah. Gecko, you know, the, the, with Michael yeah. Douglas, the, the Wall Street banker wolves of the 1990s, uh, who, who take high risks, who work behind the screens, behind the computers. And there you have people who are not working in the real physical business. They are not the ones in the oil field. And there's a big gap. And that holds true not only for the oil market, it holds true for so many markets. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question from, uh, not uh, a technical question, not a substantial question from Hugh Hevon, uh, one of our students. Um, actually, I have a small favorite to ask. She writes, could you send us the presentations given in the classes? So Karin, it's, it's up to you to decide. Uh, you can yeah, yeah, yeah. let us know. If, if you can send it as PDFs, please. Yeah, we, we definitely can yeah. do it. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any other uh, indications of a wish to ask a question. Guys, are there any further questions? It seems that that not good. So I wish you a fine Monday, a good start into this Thank you. last May week. <laughs> yeah, actually, I found the full version of the syllabus, which was sent to everyone at the very beginning. That that con uh, concerns the uh, deadline for essays. Uh, guys, please uh, pay attention that uh, this morning I sent you a link to a Google Disk, so you all have access to it. Uh, via the emails which you indicated when you registered for this course. No need to send requests from other emails like red, red great dragon dot uh, at something uh, gmail.com, just from your emails uh, which you used uh, while registering for this course, you are able to access this disk. And the uh, syllabus says that 
uh, an essay of three pages. Imagine you are asked by an international magazine to present a comment analysis on the topic of our course. You can, of course, go beyond the topics we will discuss in the course. Uh, so uh, the papers are due by June uh, the 10th. This is what the syllabus says. Please mind this deadline for, uh, for the essay submissions. Excuse me, please, may I ask a question? Please. Uh, is it limited only by three pages or? No, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Vice Rector Baikov, when I asked him what kind of requirements for the exam, uh, uh, he would suggest and he uh, told me, what about a three page essay? So if you feel like five page, six page, please don't don't mind. I, okay, okay. Clear. I, I know Thank what you. it feels like when you have a lot to say on your mind and then you're limited to three pages. That's just a, a rough um, uh, reference. Clear, thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me, I have another question regarding the essay. Please. Um, can we? How can we discuss the topic with you? Or uh, well, I think it. I I think it would be very difficult to discuss the topic with each and everybody among you because, as far as I know, the group is above seventy. Uh, what I may suggest is that you pick for yourself one of the we, we, we have just been discussing so many topics in and we still we still have another two weeks to go so uh you can either do write something on um for instance uh u.s election campaign if you want uh and the oil market you can write on uh the situation in the Middle East, what's next for Saudi Arabia, if you want to write something more into geopolitics. Uh, you can write about um, the situation in the Caspian, uh, what, what, what lies ahead, will the Chinese take over the entire Caspian uh, uh, producers, uh, anything you want, anything that comes to your mind. Okay, is it is it just limited to oil or could I, for example, write about natural gas pipelines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the topic was mostly oil, but we, we, anyway, we mentioned gas here and there and we will still do that in the next class, but you can, of course, also write about gas. So Nord Stream 2, would it be an appropriate Yeah, yeah, topic? yeah. Nord Stream 2 is, is actually in, in, in this presentation and Nord Stream 2, you can also write about that. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. So, I think at this moment we need to uh, give a huge applaud to Karin and apologies again for the technical disruptances. Uh, sometimes it's not very convenient and yeah. Yeah, no, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, luckily we can do it thanks to technology, electricity yeah. and so on. I'm very grateful that all that works smoothly. <laughs> thanks to oil in a way. <laughs> yeah, thanks to oil, exactly. Uh, so thank but, you very much. Yeah, yeah, but I do hope that because it, it makes a difference when you see people and you can discuss the whole thing in a different way when you're physically... Oh, that's involved. very true. That's yeah. very true. So may it day come, inshallah, that we can see each other somehow in a different way than yeah. through the screen. We will appreciate it much more once we yeah. have this experience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shall we stop here? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There's bye -bye. Bruno. He has a Bruno. I think. Yeah. The Thank you. Goodbye. Karen, thank you for your lecture as always. Goodbye. It was brilliant. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> You're most welcome. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. <laughs>